Institute's Autumn Economic Forum. My name is Steve Millard. I'm the Deputy Director here for Macroeconomic Modeling and Forecasting. I'm joined by Anab Bhattacharji, who's uh, <coughs> excuse me, the head of the department at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, but uh, uh, works for us on our public policy side. I'm also joined, very pleased to be joined by David Miles, who's one of the members of the Budget Responsibility Committee at the Office for Budget Responsibility. The way this is going to work is I'm going to talk a little bit about the macro picture and uh, refer a little bit to the autumn statement yesterday. Then Arnab is going to talk about what it all means at a more micro level. And then David is going to respond to us. And then there'll be a chance for questions. So starting with the UK economic outlook as a whole, I'm going to talk a little bit about output, a little bit about inflation and monetary policy, and then give some thoughts on the autumn statement and a new fiscal framework. So GDP growth on the edge was our theme. We forecast GDP to grow by 4.4% this year and 0.7% next year. GDP, as we know, fell by 0.2% in quarter three of this year. We're expecting it to be flat in quarter four and then to fall again in 2023-1. We don't, unlike the Bank of England, expect a two year long recession, but there is certainly a risk of that. And if you look at this, uh, this chart, you will see that there's about 20% of the probability there that GDP is going to remain, or GDP growth is going to be negative uh, right throughout our forecast period. In terms of inflation, well, we think it's, it's peaked now at, at 11%. We think it's going to stay at around about 11% until January before it starts to fall. The energy price guarantee helped there, a big deal. It lowered the peak from 14 to 11. But we do think inflation is going to now be much more persistent than we had thought it would be in August. And actually even more so on account of the rise in the energy cap in April. And in particular, we do not think inflation is going to return to target until 2025 Q3. Very different to the OBR's forecast. And I'm sure David will comment on that later. The MPC are acting to push down on inflation. They raised rates to 3% at the beginning of this month. And the market, and indeed us, uh, we now expect rates to peak of 4.75% in, in 2023 Q3. Now, the MPC in their November monetary policy report did hint at a much lower peak than that. But actually, our view is that they will need to raise rates to 4.75 if they're going to bring inflation down to target. OK, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about the fiscal position and the autumn statement. So if we go back to before the autumn statement, in fact, back in March, the Chancellor had a target of a falling debt to GDP ratio in 2025. And in March, the OBR calculated that uh, they were on course to do that with about £28 billion to spare. Unfortunately, since then, the fiscal position has worsened quite considerably. In fact, if I look at the expected deficit in 2026-27, it is now £75 billion worse than it was in March. And two-thirds of that can be attributed to higher debt interest rates. So the fact that uh, the Bank of England has been tightening, in, tightening monetary policy, interest rates have been going up, that's caused a lot of the fiscal problems. We then had the mini budget, which added about 48 billion pounds uh, to that. And then subsequently, a month later, 27 billion of the 48 billion was reversed. So the mini budget itself had an extra effect, if you like, in that it wasn't accompanied by OBR analysis. And this spooked the market. This represented quite a loss in credibility for the government. So moving to the autumn statement yesterday, 
what we actually see is a game of two halves. In 2022, three and 23, four, we actually see a fiscal loosening with extra support for households for energy bills, an uprating of pensions and benefits in line with inflation, the living wage rising. And all of this support is very valuable and very needed at this point in time. We and NISA actually think they should have gone further, but this was at least a welcome step in the right direction. Of course, after 2024, one might even say after the next election, there's a, a, a very strong a market fiscal timing built in, 60 billion pounds uh, by 2027, 28, of which roughly 30 billion is tax increases and 30 billion is spending cuts. The tax increases have been achieved in the main by freezing tax thresholds. As uh, Wilson Bell put it this morning, every tax threshold that you could possibly look at has been frozen. In addition, though, there have been spending cuts. There will be cuts in some departmental budgets. Some have been protected education, healthcare, but others are unprotected. They are gonna to have to make large cuts. And there's also been put cuts in terms of public investment in real terms. So the amount of, the nominal amount of public investment has been held fixed, but of course with inflation, that means we're gonna see less investment in real terms. So what does that mean for the fiscal position? Well, the tax burden is going to increase from 33.1% of GDP to 37.1% of GDP. That's as high as it has been since the 1950s. At the same time, spending is going to rise from 39.3% of GDP to 43.4% of GDP. But the results of the fiscal timing uh, post 2024-5 is that the deficit does fall. And it will fall to 69.2 billion, which the OBR calculate to be 2.5% of GDP in 2027-28. And public sector debt will start falling modestly as a proportion of GDP in 2026-7 and 27-8. Now, this would have failed, this uh, autumn statement would have failed the old fiscal targets that were in place back in March. So the Chancellor announced some new fiscal targets. In particular, that the deficit should be within 3% of GDP, well, it is, as you can see, and that the debt should be falling as a percentage of GDP in five years' time, rather than at the end of the parliament. And again, you can see that it has done that. So you can think, in a way, that the Chancellor has managed to achieve at least some loosening of fiscal policy simply by changing the targets. But is this the right way to do fiscal policy. I mean, these targets are arbitrary. They're set by the chancellor. He or she can set them however they want. And targets, fiscal targets, that's not what fiscal policy is about. Fiscal policy is about improving people's everyday lives. And the key to, to ensuring that this happens is credibility. If you are credible in the sense that the markets are prepared to lend to you at reasonable interest rates, then there is always fiscal space. And the credibility, the credibility comes from doing, doing the right thing, if you like. And it also comes from inviting the OBR to provide their analysis and their forecast, an independent view of what is happening. So in our occasional paper, Misa proposed a new approach, a new fiscal framework. Important parts of that were that there will be a stricter timetable for fiscal events. We would have two fiscal events a year and we would know when they were gonna happen. And these fiscal events will be associated with greater parliamentary scrutiny. So the chancellor actually stood up in parliament and said what he or she was going to do rather than spend the previous week leaking drip feeding bits of the uh, bits of the statement to the press. <clears throat> the fiscal event itself should have a clearer focus on the state of the economy, 
and an analysis of the socioeconomic implications of the policy choices that they make. The OBR should be involved in that we think they should publish pre-fiscal event reports, which include a set of key issues to which the budget or the autumn statement should respond. And the chancellor then could provide a lot more guidance as to how fiscal policy would respond if certain risks materialize. So rather than just saying, we are going to do this, the chancellor could say, well, this is, our, this is what we plan on doing, but should this risk transpire, this is how we would adjust to it. And then the OBR could produce economic forecasts and scenarios to inform those choices. We also argued that the Treasury should create a new body of independent experts, for example, advice and ex post evaluation of key fiscal choices. And Jeremy Hunt actually uh, did that last month. He created the new Economic Advisory Council, which is welcome, except we note that that was filled entirely by financial market participants. <clears throat> and uh, you might think that that might influence, if you like, the uh, the um, cost function or how the chancellor sets the budget. The final thing, which is very important from um, particularly given the government's level, leveling up agenda, is that fiscal strategy is joined up across the UK and all its constituent parts. And a particular attention is paid to distributional effects, productivity, well-being, and ecological sustainability. So that's all I'm going to say. Uh, just to conclude with the some risks, GDP, we think there's going to be anemic growth that actually makes us optimistic relative to the OBR and the bank, but we certainly think the risks are on the downside. And those risks could be further financial market turmoil, although touch wood, we have not seen that since yesterday. Uh, consumer confidence is clearly very fragile, and there's still a lot of general uncertainty in the economy. Inflation. Our key message is that it's going to be more persistent. It's going to stay higher for longer. We think the risks there are balanced. The ongoing war in Ukraine and supply chain constraints could actually keep, uh, could push inflation up, could hold it up for longer. But then again, if uh, the if GDP were to tank, uh, then we would expect inflation to come down relatively quickly in response. So I'm going to hand, hand over to my colleague Arnab who's going to talk about the outlook for UK households, the devolved nations, and the English region. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, as Stephen uh, put it, uh, we bring to you the, uh, our, our outlook of the UK households, devolved nations, and English regions against the backdrop of a continuing cost of living crisis but also importantly, the autumn statement, which came out yesterday. And uh, as Stephen put it, it was a welcome step in the right direction. Against that backdrop, our key messages are that the hardship is going to continue for a while. Nearly one in five households will have little or no savings by April, 2024, despite significant support measures which are now coming in from the government. Mortgage repayments in particular at the variable rate will rise substantially when interest rates hit their projected peak of 4.75%. And we strongly suggest that that is a path that the Bank of England should follow in order to keep inflation and inflation expectations in check. As a result of this, more than 2.5 million people will turn to food banks over the winter months. This kind of trend is not new, but it is really very sad. Some of the announcements in the autumn statement go in the right direction, but we believe that better policy options are available to tackle the cost of living crisis. Now, in terms of what's happening to households, there is, of course, a triple shock to household budgets. Energy bills, food prices have been increasing very fast. And together with that, now with movements in the interest rates, we have 
housing costs increasing. This includes both mortgage payments at the variable rate, but also potentially higher rents coming in the future. So as a result of this, 1.2 million households need to spend more than they have currently have in terms of disposable income. And we can see that households with no savings is going to increase very fast to um, quite extraordinary levels given our recent history. And this is not a short-term thing. Much of this effect is going to persist into April, middle of 2024 and beyond. Now, of course, in doing these calculations, we have factored in pandemic savings that certain households, particularly households in the top end of the income distribution have built up over that period. Despite that, we find that across almost half of the population of households, there is significant rise in you know, savings. Well, there's, there's a lack of savings to support their expenditures. The effect particularly goes quite strongly almost up to the middle of the income distribution and that, that, that is quite uh, extraordinary. It is not a surprise given the structure, the regional structure of the United Kingdom that there are regional implications of this. In fact, the geographic distribution of households with no savings shows a quite a heavy concentration in the Northeast and in parts of the Midlands, also regions which were already suffering as a result of the pandemic and, and the economic impacts of the pandemic. Well, as bank rate rises to 4.7%, which is our central projection, our calculations show that at least 50% of there will be at least 50% increase in mortgage at the variable rate, which affects households in the middle of the income distribution largely, but also 20%, up to 20% increase in private rents, which affects households largely in the second and third decals of the income distribution. However, social housing is largely protected. Uh, in terms of rents. As a result of this, almost 3 million households who are either on a variable rate mortgage or with mortgages which are up for remortgaging within one year, or they are trying to get onto the housing ladder, they will suffer quite a bit, together with another 5, five million in private rented accommodation. There is policy which is helping in this respect, particularly the energy price guarantee and other support measures, but they do not reach the lower income households sufficiently. And also they are fiscally expensive because it subsidizes higher income households. Lower income households still face energy bills which are 30 to 40% higher, but the most important thing is that the energy price guarantee does not provide sufficient incentive to save energy, which is surely something that we want to do in terms of achieving a fair transition towards zero carbon. So in the autumn statement, the energy plan increases the cap to 3000 pounds together with very importantly, 900 pounds cost of living payments to those on universal credit. This is more targeted than before, but low income households who are not in receipt of welfare, they lose out. And still this is a universal subsidy. So savings could be potentially made at a time when it is important to be fiscally responsible. Together tax rises, reductions and freezes in income thresholds, increase in council taxes, which are due to start very soon or increase very soon, expected windfall tax from the 30 billion in tax cuts in September to 30 billion in tax rises in November, 
most importantly this kind of policy you know changes in policy create huge amount of uncertainty for households and farms and that is to the detriment of society and economy as a whole surely one of the purposes of policy is to reduce uncertainty not increase it so who gains from the energy plans well largely the bottom two decades they gain from it one would have expected that perhaps the energy plan would have been organized in a slightly different way to also protect the third decal perhaps the part of the fourth decals as well but on the whole these are welcome steps so in aggregate from the autumn statement we find quite a few positives universal credit pensions and living wage uplift in line with inflation this has not happened for a while and this is very much welcome also targeted support to those on welfare at the same time we think that there is a lack of support for those in work increase in bills of course and freezing increasing tax thresholds place high burden on household finances so our policy options then are a combination of two things i'm going to focus on the household and welfare side first and then move on to the regional a variable price cap to cut energy bills for the lower income households this would work by raising the unit cost of energy with usage that incentivizes higher income households to potentially save some of their energy costs and because of the high correlation between income and energy usage this would on average reduce the bills for the poorest and raise the bills for the richest of course there would be exceptions to this rule that would be necessary and that can be handled by policy as well within existing social security schemes now the other side of the story is of course regional divergence and we are as a result of the cost of living crisis and the continued uh, somewhat tentative uh, growth uh, or lack thereof we are seeing so sharply rising regional divergence here on the top panel we have some patterns that we see for output across the english regions and the bottom panel for the devolved nations of the united kingdom particularly on the, on the top we can see that across english regions there is sharply rising regional divergence in output and similarly in employment in employment the effect is also particularly pertinent across the devolved nations of the united kingdom northern ireland in particular now northern ireland has been a little bit of an exception to the rule if we may uh, uh, put it this way uh, in the sense that since the northern ireland protocol and and the uh, you know tentative brexit that we have had it has performed slightly better than the uk as a whole uh, but of course london has performed much better but in the lack of consistent policies regional policies in northern ireland we do not see this uh, you know a little bit of better performance continuing into the future so in terms of regional policy we would like the government to turn some of the leveling up ambition into reality and therefore the government should maintain capital spending outside london and the southeast and work with business to unlock private investment also work with local governments devolving decision making and spending powers particularly in important policy areas like skills housing research and development in conclusion households continue to withstand the crisis with the savings but a significant proportion are set to see their savings eliminated this requires then targeted assistance not general subsidy and the steps that the government 
taking, particularly in the autumn statement, are in the right direction, but they can do more. There is fiscal room for maneuver, particularly within the context of a fit for purpose fiscal framework to help the most vulnerable households and regions. Most importantly, policy uncertainty needs to be reduced. Thank you. You, uh, you may be relieved to know that I will not show you lots of charts. The publications that we put out yesterday from uh, the OBR um, have more charts than you would, uh, you would need for the rest of your life. So I'm not going to show you any. What I'm going to do is just make a few very brief uh, comments in response to the interesting things that Arnab and Stephen have just, have just said. Let me, let me start out very briefly, if I might, by explaining a little bit about why the projections that we made yesterday coincide with the autumn statement from the OBR, why those projections are so much more gloomy in many ways than the ones we had made in March, just seven or so months ago. And the main reason is that the developments in the period since the spring have been, to put it very mildly, not helpful for the UK. And it's not just the UK, because the things that have hit the strength of economies pretty much across the world, certainly amongst Western European countries, have been common shocks energy prices, which had already risen by the spring, went up rather substantially further over the period since then. Gas and oil prices up. Interest rates globally have increased very sharply. This is not a uniquely UK phenomenon. And more domestically within the UK, the recovery that we'd expected in the size of the labor force from people returning to work after the worst parts of COVID hopefully behind us have been a bit slower than we thought. And the combination of these three things, but in particular, and most significantly, the interest rate increases that have affected pretty much all economies and have increased the cost of debt to governments, to households, and to corporations. That increase in interest rates allied with a very substantial in further increase in energy prices. We estimated the OBR has reduced the productive potential of the UK economy. If you look down the road to what the longer run implications of this is by not far off three and a half percent. That's, that's a combination of investment being more expensive because interest rates are higher, short-term hit to demand from households dealing with increases in energy costs and mortgage costs, and a response to higher energy prices, which makes some parts of the productive potential of the economy, frankly, no longer viable. So these different sources of shocks to the productive potential of the UK have changed the situation in an adverse direction very substantially since March. Three and a half percent off the productive potential of the UK economy five years down the road. What does that mean in numbers? It means that the UK economy might be about a hundred billion pounds smaller than we thought back in March at the last OBR overall forecast, a hundred billion pounds smaller than we had thought then, if you look four or five years down the road. And meanwhile, the government understandably has responded to one of the sources of this shock, the higher energy prices, with an enormous support package, part of which was announced back in the spring, part in the summer in May, but a further substantial chunk just much more recently, a support package to households and companies skewed towards households, which this year and next adds up to something like 100 billion pounds. So an economy that might be of the order of 100 billion pounds smaller five years down the road, and one in which there's 100 billion pounds of support to households in the near term, is not surprisingly one in which the fiscal situation has become much more strained and that shows up in our forecasts where the stock of debt to GDP four or five years down the road is 18% of GDP more 
in 26, 27 than we had predicted back in the uh, spring time. And the stock of debt, the amount of government debt outstanding, may be of the order of 400 billion pounds on our central forecast, bigger four or five years down the road than we thought in March. And that's a result of the UK, along with pretty much all the developed economies, with a few exceptions, the few oil exporting countries would be an exception. Norway might be a prime example. The UK, along with pretty much all the developed economies and the rich economies of the world, who are big importers of commodities, many of them, simply being worse off as a result of the things we need being substantially more expensive, allied with a very substantial increase in interest rates, which hits anybody who's borrowed a lot of money. And that includes many households in the UK, and it certainly includes the UK government. So that's the difficult situation from which we start, and how has the government responded to this? Um, well, with a strategy of ultimately tightening fiscal policy, but not right now, and allowing the stock of debt to rise much quicker than it expected before, borrowing a large amount more money. We're a little bit more optimistic, perhaps, on the inflation front than the National Institute. And our forecast would suggest, our central forecast, around which there's huge uncertainty, of course, that inflation actually, which is driving a big hole in the real disposable income of households in the UK right now and into next year, with inflation you know, close to 11 10% for month, months more to come, we're a bit more optimistic than the National Institute about how that plays out a bit further down the road, where we think that inflation actually drops back very sharply once we get through next year and go through 2024. And that's largely on the back of our using at the OBR, the market projections of what happens to oil and gas prices, which is instead of carrying on rising, they actually fall fairly meaningfully uh, from now on, we're kind of more or less at the peak of energy prices if you use market forecasts for where they're going. And that brings down inflation, we think, on our central forecast anyway, really rather sharply, and inflation will fall beneath the Bank of England's target um, for perhaps a sustained period starting a couple of years from now. So that's one way in which our forecasts differ a little bit from those of the National Institute. We're slightly more pessimistic than the National Institute, though not as pessimistic as the Bank of England, as it turns out, in terms of the, the near-term trajectory to overall GDP, where our, our central guess anyway is that it falls uh, for most of next year and the GDP is actually declines for the whole of next year. And I think the National Institute is a little bit more optimistic on on that. In terms of the trajectory of taxes and spending, I think I agree that the strategy that the government has followed makes a lot of economic sense. It is right now, as Arna showed us very clearly, it is right now when households need support with paying bills that have gone up so much. It's not just energy bills, it'll also be more mortgages for those that have them over the course of the next year. So the strategy of providing a very large amount of fiscal support to households this year, next year, uh, and going into 2024, but on a declining trajectory seems to me a, 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 a sensible one. But then in order to stop the debt to GDP ratio, simply accelerating and rising as far ahead as you look and not turning the corner in order to avoid that happening, then you get, in a sense, payback time starting a couple of years down the road when taxes uh, rise uh, more sharply than being projected before and real government spending uh, is significantly lower than had been expected in the past. Now, that strategy, in, in, a, in a way, makes a lot of economic sense. Of course, it, it, it in some sense, strains the credibility of the fiscal framework. Um, but the market reaction to the strategy of only uh, 
turning the corner on the debt to GDP ratio, the market reaction in the 24 hours or so since the policy was announced suggests that it has been met with a degree of credibility um, and more so than the strategy announced in September, which didn't come alongside uh, an OBR forecast. And I think that tells you something about the importance of having a quantified target that is then assessed by an independent body. Um, now, I, I, I hear the message uh, that Stephen um, told us uh, a while ago about, well, the targets are arbitrary. The fiscal targets are arbitrary. And in some sense, I agree. And in some sense, I don't agree. Let me just spend um, no more than a minute or so saying something about that. Is it arbitrary to say, for example, that the debt GDP ratio should turn a corner and be falling at a particular point in the future, the government's targets now are that it should be five years ahead? Well, in some sense, yes, it is arbitrary. You could have made it four years rather than five or six years. I don't think it's arbitrary in the sense that given the environment we're in at the moment, trying to stop the debt GDP ratio rising right now, which would almost certainly have avoided, uh, sorry, meant that you could not provide the substantial support to households that is implicit in the government plans. I don't think that would have been a very good strategy. Is it arbitrary to have a debt GDP ratio target that it stops rising and turns a corner? I don't think that is arbitrary because focusing on the stock of debt to GDP in a world in which interest rates are higher does seem to me the right kind of thing to be focusing on to assess the affordability of the government's plans, affordability which will be focused on very much in financial markets, which could have responded very perversely, uh, adversely, more than perversely perhaps, to the announcements yesterday. And that has not uh, happened. So I think having a quantified target, having an independent body which assesses the probability then of hitting that target is actually a, a, a quite a sensible uh, framework to set monetary policy in. I do agree with what Stephen said that having alternative scenarios, assessments of what would happen if things turned out either a bit better or a bit worse or a lot better or a lot worse than some central forecast is an essential component of the, the framework. And it's something that the OBR um, spends quite a bit of time on. And in the report that we put out yesterday, we showed some of the implications for borrowing for interest rates being higher or lower than the central forecast. We used the market expectations where interest rates will go as our central forecast. And we showed the sensitivity of the fiscal position to higher or lower interest rates. And that sensitivity is substantial, partly because the stock of debt is, is significantly higher and more of it is affected by changes in interest rates more quickly than in the past. We also showed scenarios with um, higher energy prices and what that does to the fiscal outlook, and that also has a pretty big impact. Finally, um, do we need another body of independent experts? Well, actually, I think there are bodies of independent experts, and I'm with one right now. The National Institute is uh, one of the most respected for very good reasons. Uh, commentators are analyzers of the economic outlook. There are others, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the Resolution Foundation. Um, and then, of course, there's the OBR itself, which in some sense produces this sort of official forecast, but always draws upon expertise at the National Institute and the IFS and Resolution Foundation in its own assessment. And we're very grateful for that. So do we need Another body, in a sense, I think we've got enough very well-informed commentators in the UK, and it is not as if their analysis and their message is ignored and doesn't get through. It certainly is heard very clearly at the, at the OBR. Um, let me stop at that point, because I want to be sure there's a lot of time for responses to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Lots of food for thought, as uh, you would have expected, but uh, I'm, I'm going to hand the floor, the virtual floor, I guess, open to people to ask questions of any of the three of us. Thank you, Stephen. So we've got one question from Jane Binner, which is, 
Given the great disparities between the regions, what is being done to support the government's levelling up agenda? I won't start on that, Monday. <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that is a great question. I, I think if we uh, take a little bit of a step back, uh, the leveling up white paper was actually a fantastic positive step. Uh, despite the limitations that we know in terms of an evidence based with respect to how one needs to go about leveling up, it was a, a very positive step. Uh, and it, we would certainly hope that the government, that was not a flash in the pan, uh, that the government would take this seriously consistently over the medium run to try and make positive change. This would involve, of course, investments in different parts of the country, carefully chosen, but would also involve a greater process of devolution of responsibility and power down to regions, even beyond regions to local levels. Now, how much of that ambition still remains <coughs> it needs to be seen. But of course, this is against the backdrop of quite severe fiscal situation in the country as a whole. So uh, we, I, I think the jury is a bit open. I mean, to, to add to that, I think there's a worry from my point of view is that a lot of the leveling up agenda uh, really requires that kind of public investment, which, as I said earlier, will be falling in real terms in the second in post 2024-25. So that, so my worry is that as public investment as a whole falls, then there'll be less scope for leveling up. Thank you. Uh, question here from Jeremy Holmes. Uh, could we say anything about the sectoral prospects and the differential impacts from the multiple economic shocks that we've outlined? Again, probably something for Arnab. Um, uh, thank you. Um, again, a, a great question. So in this particular outlook, we have not added to our story regarding the sectoral structures in the United Kingdom but they uh, go behind our uh, you know, analysis uh, in, uh, into looking at what, what is going on across the country. And we see some positives there and some negatives. Uh, uh, there is weakness in terms of uh, manufacturing in parts of the Midlands that we um, observe in the data and that is factored into our analysis. We also see uh, opportunities in different parts of the country uh, there is investment coming into some parts, even of the Northeast that we are aware of. There, there are uh, some strengths in specific high-tech sectors spread across the country. But in order to generate full benefits of this, one needs targeted investment in these areas. And, uh, you know, the, again, I think the jury is quite uh, open about it. I think the, the big shocks that have hit the UK economy actually affect pretty much all households and pretty much all sectors of the economy. Most private enterprise, depending on what sector you're in, maybe to slightly different extents, but most companies are users of energy. Uh, in fact, nearly all are. And most of them got some borrowing. Uh, all households are units of it, users of energy and a very large proportion of households have debt. So when you get hit by a shock that increases interest rates and increases energy prices, in some sense, there's nowhere to hide. It just gets everybody. Thank you. Question here from uh, Sir John Gave. Commentary on public services has focused on the changing assumptions about spending growth after 2025. But has the OBR calculated the real term squeeze on most programs in the near term? Then in brackets, the plan for current spending, excluding NHS and school spending, is flat in cash terms for the next two years. I mean, it's certainly true that with flat cash spending and inflation turning out a good bit higher than was predicted six months or so ago, 
that that is going to put great pressure on uh, many departmental spending limits. It depends to some extent, maybe to a large extent, not so much on what happens to retail price inflation or CPI inflation. It depends what happens to, to public sector wages. Real spending will be squeezed in some sense so much and the burden will be passed on the public sector workers if wage settlements stay at low levels and fall very well short of inflation, generating a very big hit to real disposable income to public sector workers. If on the other hand, public sector wages rise, perhaps not to match CPI or RPI inflation, but to get a lot closer to it, then there needs to be cut back somewhere else. So there's no easy answer to the question, well, what's going to give? Something will give, and it's going to be a difficult couple of years. But that's not unique to the public sector, of course. I'd like to very much thank my colleagues, Arnab uh, Neil, who was a uh, host for the questions. Very, very much like to thank David for coming along today and, and uh, putting me right, in particular on deflationary spirals. And uh, thank the audience, uh, almost all of whom I can't see, for, for tuning in and uh, helping to make this uh, the, the wonderful event that it is. Thanks all. <laughs>